Hello? Hi. Yes, the mic's working. Great. Thank you for coming, uh, getting on in the afternoon today. My name is Rob Clark. I'm a distinguished engineer at uh, IBM. Uh, some of you might know me from the various talks I've done around OpenStack security over the last couple of years. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of, the, some of the things we've really been focused on during the last release and some of the things you should be able to reap the benefits of going forward. So I was trying to decide what to talk about today, and part of the reason I was go going through this process was because I was supposed to be presenting a small part of somebody else's deck, and unfortunately he can't be here because he just had a baby, which I think is quite rude of him, but there you go. So I'm going to try and fumble through the whole lot. So I'm going to start with um, security-related projects. Now, what security isn't? Security isn't Keystone. Security isn't Barbican. It isn't Castellan. And it's also not Solometer or Congress and some other things as well. Um, they're all security-related projects. We benefit from them being in the community. Um, they're either not directly focused on security or they're only focused on individual parts. Things like Keystone and Barbican are big enough to be self-sustaining projects on their own. But there are a lot of things that aren't, and a couple of them I'm going to talk to you about today. But to give them their, their, uh, their due, uh, Keystone, almost everyone here should know, uh, provides authentication with a big N and authorization with a little a. Um, so what that basically means is that Keystone provides you with pretty robust authentication mechanisms. The authentication side of stuff, uh, sorry, the authorization side of stuff, the who is allowed to do what, the user role stuff, um, is more diverse and a little bit weaker. There's, you know, there's ongoing discussions around dynamic policy and that sort of stuff. But really interesting highlights. Um, they now have credential encryption at the back end for databases. So when you're using various uh, Keystone backends, you get credential encryption in there. And a real driver for that was a whole bunch of work that's been done during this cycle on PCI readiness. So there's an awareness within the OpenStack community that things have to be moving to a position where deployers of OpenStack can go through PCI DSS with relatively little pain. It's never painless. Um, and that means bringing in features like credential encryption. Barbican provides secret, managements for open, secrets management for OpenStack, um, enables a lot of security features. It's a really pivotal security technology within OpenStack, because basically anything that wants to do encryption for its users, like Swift, like Nova, will rely on Barbican often for its secrets. Um, it supports PKCS11 and KMIF HSMs, Dog tag is also supported and has been for a very long time. And I've put it down as a highlight here. The certificate management system is deprecated. Um, so this means that Barbican isn't going to be responsible anymore for requesting certificates for your service, but you can still warehouse them there if you want to. And uh, this is really good because it signifies a real narrowing of focus within Barbican to really managing secrets. Castellan is another security supporting project. Uh, it can sometimes be described as like a, a middleware or an adapter between services and Barbican, which today really it is. But it exists so that you can integrate with other key managers if you want to. Often this gets attributed to the security project, but really if it's, if it's attributable to anyone, it's Barbican, which is where it came from. So what is the security project? So I'm going to go through a super brief history because I've done talks on this before. Um, so around about the Folsom time frame, uh, myself and, and Brian Payne got together at the summit and decided that security should probably something, be something that was in OpenStack. Um, no, we followed on from that by creating the vulnerability management team along with other people and um, starting off the security notes process. Um, time goes on, Havana passes by, we end up with a security guide. I can see a number of the authors from the security guide in the audience today. Uh, we all got together in Annapolis, I think, and spent a week writing a book, which was fun. You can buy it in tree form. Um, then IceHouse comes around, we start building out security tooling like Anchor and Bandit. And now, with these newest releases, we've really had a focus on threat analysis and on Cintraboss, which are the two main things I'm going to focus on today. So the security project has a number of member organizations. We have con contributions regularly from all of these groups. Um, it's worth pointing out right now, I suppose, that security upstream or OpenStack security isn't necessarily anyone's full-time job in a security project. We don't have anyone paid by the foundation to take this stuff forward. Um, 
sometimes the contributions coming in from security interested developers and sometimes they're from security people like myself who like to pretend they can be developers. And somewhere between the two, we end up with a good mix of people. Security projects really, really operates with two pillars. Uh, so we have a development, development pillar where we create tooling like Cintraboss I'm gonna discuss in a little while, like Anchor, which is an ephemeral PKI system uh, which I've spoken about previous summits, and Bandit, which is a Python static analysis tool. And uh, there's been a lot of interest in, in Bandit recently, and there's been a number of talks on it. I suggest you go watch them. Um, if you're writing anything in Python and you're not putting it through Bandit, then there's a good chance that if you're introducing stupid errors, logical failures, using bad libraries, just doing stuff that you don't know is necessarily wrong, um, you might not be catching it, and that's the sort of stuff that Bandit can catch. It's integrated into a number of OpenStack CI gates and will be in integrated into more going forward. Uh, the vulnerability management team, OSSNs, threat analysis, and the security guide, these all stand on the second pillar, which is our guidance and governance. So in many ways, we act as a group of consultants to the wider OpenStack organization. We're available as a resource to fact check on things we work directly with the vulnerability management team who are kind of part of security, but they're, they're very autonomous in their own little box where they can um, receive and triage and deal with vulnerabilities. So this is really how the security project stacks up. Um, this is a, an evolution of images you guys have seen before. And um, I managed to get a little Lego guy on there as well, which is always good. So I promised to talk to you a little bit about threat analysis. What it really is is a security sniff test. We're looking for anything bad that's going on in the project. For a long time, this happened anyway when a project wanted to become vulnerability managed, when it wanted to have that tag that said that the project was a, a, a big enough part of OpenStack that people like the VMT were going to support you when vulnerabilities come in. They're going to give you an embargoed process. They're going to go and get CVs for you. They're going to help you uh, de deploy fixes. And this really consisted of uh, software engineers going and just having a look through the code and seeing if there was anything sensible. These weren't necessarily security people, but they were security interested. And that's really where it started. A few releases ago, we started talking to the VMT about ways we could improve threat analysis. We even did a talk about one way we attempted to do it using a functional decomposition um, a few summits ago. Uh, that didn't work. It didn't scale very well at all. Scale turns out to be the really difficult thing. Threat analyses are something that security people like myself end up doing a lot. And there's a lot, my, my friend Travis McPeaks over here, uh, he coined a term security architect magic, which is where we look at a, a diagram or something, and we go, oh, well, that bit's wrong. And then if you give us enough time, we'll probably work out why it's wrong in, in a way we can articulate. But we needed to try and remove as much of that magic as we could to develop a process where developers can drive it more than we do. So any threat analysis process should be able to identify entry points, assets, and persistence within a system. It should be able to document where data transits, um, where it goes through any format changes, um, so well, where it goes through any transformations and the formats of those transformations, so where it's stored, the origin, and, and, and the destination. That's because this is where most vulnerabilities come from. A huge, huge number of vulnerabilities just come down to changing data from one format to another and not really thinking about what you're doing. And that can be from reading it off disk into memory. It can be from parsing. It can be from all sorts of stuff. But they really don't generally fall into these categories. And one of the main things we have here is impact of control failure. So our aspiration here is to create a system that allows us to have a rich enough set of documents that when a project has a vulnerability, the VMT or that project can look at their threat analysis and understand what the effects are of that control that just failed because of the vulnerability and be able to very quickly document how to respond to it. So as all good things, this started at a mid-cycle and it started on a whiteboard. And generally, you know, there's, there's very few problems in the world you can't solve with a whiteboard <laughs> until you walk away and try and turn it into a real process. Um, the real process ends up some, looking a little bit something like this. And this is all documented and online now. But um, So you identify a common deployment and identify best practice. And this is pivotal for how we're going to do things in OpenStack. Projects like Nova, we're, <laughs> we're going to build up to, but can be deployed in many different ways and in many, diff many different use cases. So they can be private clouds. They can be public clouds. They can be 
federated educational stuff. Like, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and we can't provide a threat analysis for all of them. So we asked the development teams, well, you know probably what your most co common deployment models are, and you know what your best practices are. So that's what we model. And if people diverge from best practice, then they're already going down a bad road anyway. But if we document that best practice through threat analysis, then hopefully there's a more incentive to stay with it. So in our process, it starts with diagramming out the application. We do this collaboratively. We do it online. We do it in the room. Or we do it through something like a Google Hangout or insert your whatever chat mechanism here. And we found this work quite well with Barbican, which is the first project that we've taken through this end to end. Then we produce an asset catalog. We'd list all the, where all the really interesting bits of a system are and how they persisted. Um, we document the failure impacts. And then it gets submitted to a repository. Now, it might be that the security team doesn't even get involved until this submit to repository stage. Um, when it comes in, we'll do a review. When we've reviewed it and we're happy that it looks good, and looks good doesn't mean it doesn't have any vulnerabilities. Looks good means we've had a look at the documentation that was provided, and we are happy that it gives an accurate assessment of the project. If it says there are five vulnerabilities and there are bugs, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's good. That's a good threat analysis. That means they've done well on that project. Um, so then you should, if you comply with all the other things that the um, VMT want you to do, get your vulnerability management tag and, and be awesome. So we had to buy, build a simplified diagram method for this. And it's really simple. It's based on Droyo. You have basic actors, basic symbols you'll all be familiar with, like databases and queues. We have dotted line actors. So any dotted line actor is a third party early. We recognize that even in best practice deployments, it's extremely rare that a project like Barbican might have its own MySQL database. They probably have to share it with a dozen other services because the deployer is deploying three control plane nodes or something like that. So we, do, we, we document um, the data exchange between them and the transport. This is our example diagram of some notional thing where you have a, a web service on providing content, like a blogging type service. We have these security boundaries between the internet, the corporate DMZ, and a corporate network. We chose not to ring fence these completely and just use them as separators. And this is because we always, as security people, we always want to spend extra time looking at any, anything that crosses a security boundary. Unfortunately, when you do most of these things for OpenStack, almost everything transits over almost all security boundaries because things do a lot of domain bridging. But it still helps us to identify those things we need to look most closely at. So this is what Barbican looks like, which um, if you're used to these sorts of diagrams, this is actually quite a simple way of representing Barbican. But it is a best practice. It is their PKCS 11 deployment, which they see as being the most common HSM deployment. It's got third party services in there, like the Keystone event queue. Uh, they don't expect to have their own rabbit, so that's third party. They don't expect to have their own Keystone, so those are third party. And we can see how data moves around, and we can see places where things have persisted. So one thing I haven't mentioned, really, is our asset catalog in any detail. So we, we do this asset-oriented threat analysis because we found, through, mainly through trial and error, it was the most scalable way to do these things. So the, the idea here is to understand what's at risk, to quantify that, and to describe the worst case impact for those things. So after a team's got a diagram, they can start considering what's actually in these different components. So in Barbican, this is, this is just a snippet of what we had. But there was secret data, secret metadata. Right? Those are the, the, the key things that Barbican, you know, it's its bread and butter. That's the things it moves around and manipulates most. And there are things like RBAC rule sets, RabbitMQ credentials. All these different credentials could be in one file, but instead we don't say, well, the barbican.conf file is, a, is an asset. We look at the individual things. There'll be a lot of stuff in there like debugging and things we don't care about, so we're not really going to put them in. But individual credentials, they live there now, but they might be overridable in environment variables, and they might be provided in some other way, or maybe you can override them through the API. So we'd like to identify them all in turn. Uh, I've pulled out the RabbitMQ credentials. Once we've had this asset list, we basically do a simple security triad. Yes, I know there are other things like stride we could apply, but again, we need this to be small. We need it to be scalable. So we're looking at in confidentiality, integrity, availability. And for each of these, we're looking at what the very worst case is. And we're postulating. So we're saying, if there's an integrity failure, so an attacker can write to these credentials, what can they do? Well, we know they can change the credentials. The worst thing we can think of they can do with that is cause a denial of service within Barbican. Confidentiality, they could get access to the queue. The worst thing we could find them doing there was exhausting the queue, because there wasn't anything too secret that was going across that queue. 
an availability, if there's an availability problem with access to this asset, then again, you're going to have this denial of service situation. So with Barbican, we, we generated a number of findings. Uh, modifications of ACLs could uh, end up compromising various secrets, um, misconfigured HSM credentials. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I'm going to quickly, I think, deep dive through one of the more interesting problems we found. But before I do, I'm not picking on Barbican. It's just that this was the first project we took all the way through, and we will find similar problems in other projects. Um, I'm going to explain the way a system was built, the way uh, it evolved slightly, and then when we did our threat analysis, we were able to identify problems with the implicit security model that they built. So this is the point where the documentation has been generated, the diagram has been generated, and then it punted to us as a security project to have a look. So the database model for using PKCS11 in, in, in Barbican is basically PKCS11 is one way of talking to an HSM. It's very scalable. It uses a database for everything. And the implied model is that it's fail safe. So everything that happens in the database is protected because all the cryptographic operations have to happen on an HSM, which should provide you with a higher degree of assurance. Um, basically, confidentiality assured. So I'm going to quickly walk you through how this works. So if Bob wants to store a secret, he tells Barbican, hey, I want to store a secret. Barbican talks to the HSM and says, hey, HSM, here's a secret. Please wrap it with a key that I don't know about. I know you have it, but I don't know what the key is. Then return me the encrypted version, the wrapped version, and I'll go store it in the database. I know there are keystone interactions and other things, but I'm trying to keep this simple. So then Bob wants to get his secret. So he says to Barbican, hey, can I have my secret? Barbican goes, gets the wrapped secret from the database because it's encrypted and protected, pushes that to the HSM and says, hey, unwrap it. HSM unwraps it, passes it back to Bob, via, uh, while Barbican passes it back to Bob. That's great. But that turns out to be not that useful in the cloud. What I really want to be able to do is create an object for some purpose, have it encrypted so I know my cloud provider can't necessarily access it whenever they want or whatever your various security assertions are. But I might need someone else to be able to access that object. It's rare that tenants do things that only they are concerned with. Quite often, they want to be able to share things with other tenants or other services. So in this case, Bob wants to grant Alice access to a secret. So he tells Barbican, I need you to remember to give Alice access to this secret if she requests it. Stored in that, that ACL change is stored in the database. And then, um, then when Alice wants to get that secret for a legitimate reason, Alice says to Barbican, hey, can I have Bob's secret? Barbican looks in the database and says, well, is, is Alice entitled to this secret? Database ACL comes back. Yes, she is. OK, great. OK. I'll get that secret from uh, Bob's account. I'll go push it to the HSM. They can unwrap it. I'll get it back, and I'll give it to Alice. Now, one of the things we found during threat analysis was that um, when we looked at the integrity failure for the database, we were like, well, there's this ACL table in the database that's not protected. So what if I, as an attacker, add myself to the access list for Bob's secret? That's not protected by the HSM. So what ends up happening is an attacker who, if there's an integrity failure on the database, and remember the model is supposed to support the database being compromised in that way and never expose secrets. And it, if you steal the database, you can't expose the secrets. But if you can just get into the database for a second or two and add yourself to the ACL tables, then uh, an attacker can then say to Barbican, hey, I, I, want the, uh, I want Bob's secret. And Barbican checks the ACL table and goes, oh, attacker, yeah, I, I see you're in the ACL table for Bob's secret. And then it will go off to the very secure HSM, decrypt the key, and pass it back to you. So what we end up with then, if I go back to the um, database model for PKCS11, this was the original assertion. And through threat analysis, we actually found that the model doesn't work as it is today because there's this problem in the database. We found a really big design problem. And um, you know, we've, we've, got a, we've got a bug in now. Um, I figured we should put a bug in for it. Uh, there was some discussion at the moment about whether the security team should put bugs in or whether the teams who've done this, who, uh, whether the development team should. And you know, I'm happy either way. This was discovered in the open. We do our threat analysis on an etherpad. So there's no point necessarily putting in an embargoed bug. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's a good validation of, of what we're doing. You know, this is a, quite an interesting implementation-oriented thing. We're not entirely sure what the fix is, 
Well, the direct fix is to make sure that you, are, you can identify when there's an integrity failure on the ACL. Now, that could mean using some database property that provides signing or hashing or doing some out of band verification or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but we're, as a security project, we're quite happy to now. What should happen is we're on this bug, so they'll propose a change. We'll take that change and we'll put it into how we know the system works from the threat analysis. And then we'll just run through the same steps again and see if we get it with a better result. So during this release, we've created a threat analysis process that we hope has these qualities. So we've got a clear diagram methodology, basic security assertions, that you, that's your confidentiality, integrity, availability. It supports new projects going through the vulnerability management process. The expectation from all of you here that have already got the tag, the expectation is that you will come around and do a threat analysis at some point to be able to maintain your vulnerability management, vulnerability managed status. So Nova, Neutron, everyone else that's got big scary projects where you know there's those nasty corner cases. Um, just start thinking about this, we're gonna come back around. That's not a threat because to be honest, I don't, for the threat analysis, I don't really care if you have big vulnerabilities in your projects. My point is to document and understand where they are to be able to provide support to the VMT and others, fun as it is to find problems in projects. Okay, I'm gonna to talk to you for a minute or two about another new project we have. So this is Cintraboss. Uh, Cintraboss provides us with an API fuzzing framework built specifically for OpenStack. So fuzzing is basically where you have, for API fuzzing at least, where you understand certain paths, certain parameters, and you provide them with what is sometimes garbage input, sometimes it's um, partially based on templates, which is how Cintraboss works. Um, but basically you're injecting unexpected input into these different parts of a system and seeing how they react. We use uh, raw request templates within Cintraboss. Um, at some point in the future, when op if OpenStack ever has like full swagger definitions for all of the services, then we can possibly build something based on that. It's something I really like the idea of, but right now uses raw templates, which actually means it's very easy for a developer to build tests specific for their service. Um, you know, there's no formal changes, no formal swagger declarations, or any choose your API documentation framework. None of those are required. Cintraboss at the moment is targeting these services. It has found vulnerabilities and issues in all of them. Um, and it's still very much in a, in a beta stage. And these are what it tests for in general. So these are fairly typical um, types of vulnerabilities that we find in OpenStack services. Buffer overflows not so much, but it will find them in supporting libraries and things that we're using from time to time. Um, thing, uh, we de definitely get a lot of issues coming up with like cross-site scripting and string validation and those sorts of problems, which you'd expect as we're dealing with mostly stuff written in Python. It's extremely easy to use. Um, it's available on PyPy. I think a new release dropped last night. Um, it's also obviously an OpenStack repo. I see lots of pictures, people taking pictures of that, so I'll wait a second. There we go. So commands are very simple. And I'm actually going to show you a quick video because I was too scared to do a demo uh, in, in a second. But it is, it is very, very simple to run through. Um, OK, now, now we're going to see if internet magic works. We are, but I'm going to have to do a little bit of scrolling. But that's OK. So these guys actually, uh, the Cintraboss team, I'll mention them in a minute, but they actually put this video together yesterday. So work on, you know, they, they've moved into a, a virtual M for Cintraboss. That's how the init works. I think we track from the bottom of the screen here. There we go. So ask you two or three questions as it's doing its initialization. Um, it's all set up. It's ready to run now. So just quickly edit a configuration, um, which is going to be up at the top of the screen, of course. Basically just changing the port things are running on, changing to a testing directory um, where we've got our payloads, which are the nasty bits, and our templates, which express where you need to point the nasty things at. Quit out of that. And then we're going to run through our SQL tests. This is much easier than trying to do a live demo. Uh, run through its tests. We got our results in a nice, parsable JSON format. And we found there were a number of, number of failures, no errors. 
Um, and we find that in a few places, the server's returning 501s, which it should only be doing if something broke on the server end, um, which means, at the very least, there is some HTTP compliance bug we need to go fix because they're returning the wrong errors. Or it could mean that something broke in very nasty ways. Fuzzes generally consist of a testing side and a debugging side. Now, it's the same if you're testing something written in C. It's the same if you're testing um, a web service. You need something that generates errors, and you need something that allows you to interpret and expect er inspect errors. Um, here, the two are separate. So now we, we've got a log of this. We know where it happened. You can go back through the other logs. And then we can go and have a look at the resulting output from that service, and we can sync them together. And obviously, it doesn't take much to use things like Cola or, or any other containerized service to allow you to spin up a service, run a set of individual set of things, see how the service reacted, trash it again, and bring up an entirely new clean service. So we can step through these things relatively quickly. So it's found a number of bugs. Found, find it, found, found 500 errors in Cinder Glance, Keystone, Neutron. Some that cover all of them. Uh, it found a um, stored cross-site script in Horizon. Now, that, um, that did end up being a duplicate that someone else had reported externally. But at this point, um, OpenStack's been through many of the good quality uh, open source, uh, commercial, I should say, sorry, um, static and dynamic analysis tools. It's had web inspect, it's had app scan, it's had people look at it with coverity and all this other stuff. And they didn't find this, and Citroboss did. So that's good. Um, stored XSS is bad, especially in Horizon, because you can access a lot of stuff from there. And we're, we're finding other things as well, so that's always good. Cintraboss team, they helped me a lot. They put together that video. Um, like I said before, I'm, I'm the PTL of Security Project. I provide a home for smaller projects to come in to work on security things. We provide them support, ways to work into the um, OpenStack CI and those sorts of things. It's being dominated right now, it's fair to say, by uh, Rackspace and Intel. Intel through the uh, OSIC and a couple of Rackspace guys that are driving it as well. Um, I know they're looking for more support, more involvement. It's really not that hard to write payloads, to write templates, um, especially if you're looking at templates for your services. I know they'd be interested in looking at more. They have to prioritize the things that to them are high priority, but I know one or two other people I've spoken to over the course of this week are interested in writing templates as well. So we're coming towards the end of my talk now. I spoke to you about threat analysis. I spoke to you about Cintraboss. Those are the two really new things I wanted to highlight to today because they really are helping us kick the ball a bit further down the road regarding security. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the other things we've done. So we uh, helped create a security white paper. It's available. Um, the link is at the bottom of the slide there. Um, it's high-level marketing-y type paper, but it does go over a lot of the things that we do on a regular basis, as well as some of those things that you might want to consider when you're deploying a service. We weren't the only people involved, so we had people from OpenStack, Selena, Zettabyte, and obviously myself and Travis who contributed to that paper as well. Uh, CIS, CII best practice is interesting. So the Linux Foundation has been around for about 20 years. And Heartbleed dropped a couple of years ago. Everyone knows what Heartbleed is, right? You're probably not in this room if you don't. But just largely speaking, the, the worst internet-facing vulnerability in the last 10 years. Um, the Linux Foundation went, oh, um, that's not good. And the people that were working on OpenSSL uh, were doing it on almost a volunteer basis, which is not necessarily untrue of a lot of people that work on OpenStack as well. So the Foundation uh, realized this is bad. We need to get money together to pay these guys to be able to deploy uh, software securely. Um, they also created a badge for everybody they didn't want to give money to. <laughs> they could only give money to a few critical projects. For, for everyone else, they wanted to create this, this badge, which meant that they'd met a, a minimum security baseline. So they, they, so they did this. They created this badge. And basically, it means that your, your project follows a number of good practices. There's a significantly larger number than are listed here. So these are some of the highlights. Uh, my understanding is that um, Around about 200 projects have gone for, have applied for this um, security best practice badge. Um, 39 or so of them uh, have been issued the badge. But of those, only one project got the badge without having to need to make any changes or, or revise the way they were doing things. And um, that was actually us, which is nice. Uh, so we, <laughs> 
thank you. <laughs> so we were um, very pleased to be able to get this. Uh, we went and st stood up on stage for the keynote yesterday and waved. But um, as exciting as that was, it made me realize a couple of things. Firstly, you know, OpenStack is very big. It's very difficult to chase uh, down security issues. Um, we can only do that with the support of the community, with the core sex and the different teams and the various people that are involved. Um, it also allowed, allowed me to take a minute to really think about what it is that we've delivered. And I think there are a lot of gaps and not all, I can't think of a single team that is leveraging everything that we put out there as a community right now. But we continue to try and push out guidance. Um, we try and push out tools, like I said before, like Anchor, like Bandit, like Cintraboss. And we uh, continue to try and um, support teams wherever we can through, off, through things like threat analysis. Um, so this is, this is what we've really been up to recently. So we've got the threat analysis done. We're finding bugs with Cintraboss. Uh, we've hit, a few of them are in embargo, but we've got 80 draft or, or, or issued um, OpenStack security notes. Um, Luke at the front here has been um, really supportive in driving that recently. Uh, we've got a revamp security guide out. Uh, a mid-cycle, we knew we, want, we wanted to spend a bit more time on Barbican, so we were actually quite flexible with our mid-cycles and tried to schedule it to overlap with theirs, uh, which allowed us to actually be in the room with them and work with them. Uh, we can't do that with all projects, but if there are projects that are really concerned, then we can go do that. Um, Barbican's a natural fit for us, firstly, because a number of us like to try and contribute to that project when we can, and secondly, because being very security-oriented, it's important that they get their stuff right, because everybody who wants to build encryption technology on top of that key management is going to be relying on them. We work closely with the vulnerability management team, so there are a number of us on the security project, the cause, if you will, who... Um, get pulled into vulnerabilities when the VMT isn't sure about what the impact might be or how widely they might spread. And these two other two I mentioned, the CII best practice and the security white paper. So you know, that's what we've gone through this cycle. Um, next cycle, we're looking for more of the same. We have this idea of the security incubator right now, which is basically where we can bring in smaller projects. Um, they don't necessarily have to be 100% um, OpenStack focused. Uh, tools like, well, any of our security tools really can be applied to other projects, but they are built primarily for OpenStack to consume. As long as they tick that box, we're happy to give them a home. We're happy to provide guidance and support as they build up into being more fully fledged things. And that's what we found has worked quite well. So with that, I want to say thank you for coming to this talk on the end of a Thursday. I hope that the community as a whole is finding these things that we're doing useful. Um, there's some resources there if, if people want to uh, reach out to us, they want to understand more about what we're doing. The blog has entries on Cintraboss, on threat analysis, on Newton in general and the different security things we're doing. Um, you know, there's a, uh, we're all, you're always welcome to come find us on OpenStack-Security. Um, the room might be a bit quiet this week, but generally speaking, we'll, we'll always be there and happy to help. So with that, that's my final slide. If there are any questions or queries, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs> cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>